The scripture lesson this morning is from 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, and beginning with the 6th verse. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. The word of God for the people of God. Today is our third Sunday in our sermon series, the B series. And the first week, we talked about what it meant to be led by God's Holy Spirit. And our focus has really been on who we're going to be, who we're going to become, rather than this to-do list of things that we're going to do for 2020. And last week, we talked about being positive. And today, we're going to talk about what it means to be content. This week I was doing some research, and I found that the average American household carries $8,400 in credit card debt. The average interest rate is 19%, and the average minimum required payment is between 2 and 4%. Now, I'm not a mathematician. In fact, I'm really not very good at math at all. But I know when we take those figures and we put together an equation, something just doesn't add up. That's not going to work. And this is really just one example of different systems that are set up in our society that I think are created for people to fail, to keep people indebted for life. And we know from other areas of research that when we go and we acquire something, when we get something now and pay for it later, that in that moment of instant gratification, there's something chemically happening in our mind. Our brain releases endorphins. And for just a moment, we experience this time of euphoria. We feel happy and excited and full of joy. But later on, when we open up our credit card bill and we notice that our balance is higher than it was before, then it actually compounds the stress and the worry and the anxiety that we've already experienced. And so this pattern, this vicious cycle begins that our brain wants to feel good again. And one of the best ways for our brain to feel good is to buy something that we can't afford. Now, 
I want us to remember that this is kind of one of those sermons where it can be easy to look around and think, this isn't for me, this is for someone else, or to try to pin it on some generation or something like that. But I think we really each need to look and evaluate our own hearts. Because this is actually just one example of what it looks like to lack contentment in our lives when we desire things that we can't have. There might be some of us here today who we can live within our means. We can buy the things that we want and have the experiences that we want without feeling stretched or stressed. We might trade in our car every two or three years or go on extravagant vacations every year or every other year. Or maybe there are some of us here who are just collectors. And we like to collect certain things. And one of the things that I've discovered about collecting is, is there really an end in sight? At what point do we say that enough is enough? And even though these two examples are quite different, we might say that they're really kind of opposite. Living outside of our means and living in our means, they actually share the same common denominator. You see, the issue of contentment is really about the fact that we were all created in the image of God. But there's brokenness inside us and around us. And there's this void in our life that really only God can fill. And the temptation that we face in almost every single aspect of our lives is to try to fill that void with something or someone else. And when we do, we'll never be content because it's a bottomless pit. The good news is that when we choose to live in the abundance of God's grace and a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, then we can know what it means to be content. Because when our focus is on the fact that God has loved us and forgiven us and provided with us a new life, then our focus isn't so much our external circumstances any longer. We can trust in God. Now, before we move on, I want to clarify that there's absolutely nothing wrong with wanting to take care of the basic needs that we have in life. In fact, Paul talks about that in his letter to his young protege, Timothy. He's writing to this young pastor, helping him understand how to lead this congregation and other congregations in Ephesus. And Paul emphasizes that it's okay for us to take care of our basic needs of food and clothing and shelter. And Jesus talks about this with his disciples as well. He tells them not to worry. That if God cares for the flowers of the field, And if God cares for the sparrow, which this is the passage where we get the song, His Eyes on the Sparrow. If God cares for the flowers and and the birds, and if God takes care of creation, then God is going to take care of us as well. And Jesus proceeds to, to, to say, whenever we are facing these circumstances to seek first the kingdom of God, and God's righteousness, and all of these other things, the worldly needs, the basic needs that we have in life, will be added to us. And so just a word of wisdom, a word of grace, if you're struggling today, I want to share with you that God is going to take care of you. Not to worry. And by virtue of being a part of this congregation, you're surrounded by people who love you and will support you. And if you have a need, you can come to us. And there won't be a hesitation to help you with the basic needs of life of food, clothing, and shelter. God will use us to care for another, one another. When it comes to this idea of contentment, whenever it's no longer trying to fill that void in our life, one of the fruits of contentment is radical generosity when we begin to be satisfied with the basic needs that we have in our lives, we actually receive joy, more joy, by giving than receiving. In fact, Jesus said this, didn't he? That it's more blessed to give than to receive. 
And Paul kind of talks about that here in this letter as well. He's actually alluding to the book of Job that says that we can't bring anything into the world and we can't take anything out with us when we go. And so the question is, what are we going to do in this time that we have on earth? with the good resources and gifts that God has given us? Are we going to acquire and accumulate a whole bunch of stuff? Or are we going to choose to be generous people? To live in, in a way that's kind of simple so that we can bless the lives of others? And I think as followers of Jesus, the answer is pretty simple. We were placed here to bless the lives of others. One thing that comes to mind is my dad retired a few years ago. He worked in uh, a corporate uh, area of, of life for over 40 years. He's a business guy, and he didn't really have a whole lot of hobbies. And so when he retired, he was looking for something to do, and he decided that he was going to go around to estate sales. And he was going to buy things and then sell them on Amazon, or not Amazon, but Facebook Marketplace and on eBay. Because he had the time to do it, he didn't need to depend upon it financially. He could just wait for somebody to come along and want a newspaper clipping from the 1970s. And so he would go around to these estate sales. And one of the patterns that he found was that people were virtually begging him to take their stuff because they wanted to get rid of it. And that image is in the back of my mind anytime that I'm thinking about making a purchase that really isn't a necessity. I think about someday that I'm going to be gone and are my kids going to be left with this responsibility of trying to just get rid of all of this stuff that I don't need anymore? Or is the, the, the legacy or the imprint that I leave on my life a blessing on the lives of others? Of blessing other people so that their basic needs can be met? Now, one of the more popular patterns of kind of adopting a life of simplicity and generosity is something called the 10-10-80 plan. And that is, we give 10% of what we have to God. And we give 10% or we save 10% of what we have. And then 80% of what we've received as a gift from God is we use on the expenses of life. And I realize that for some of us, we can probably be a little bit more generous than that. And for some of us, that would be quite a stretch. But I think that's kind of a good standard for us to follow. It's one that I try to subscribe to. And I know that as we live in a world that continues to be more skeptical and kind of cynical about organized religion and institutional church, that sometimes we wonder, you know, what's the point of of giving and, and supporting our church. Why should we do that? And today, I just want to share with you, I kind of want to brag on our connection as the United Methodist Church. I want, I want to talk to you for a minute about how when we give generously, how when we give our gifts to God through the United Methodist Church, how that ends up impacting the lives of other people. Now, when we give our offering to God at St. Andrew, it's obviously used here to keep the programs going and to support our staff, to keep the lights on, and on most Sundays to keep our heat on. <laughs> we have all kinds of programs where we help feed people, and we teach people about the good news of Jesus Christ, and all of that is great and wonderful, but that's kind of just happening at a local level. Level, And I think that most of us, we want to make a difference around the world. And so every time that we give our offering to God, we are blessing the lives of people not only in St. Albans near us, but around our state and around the world. The way that our conference uses apportionment funds is to help support our seven mission sites that we have around the state. And we're going to be going on a mission trip to one of those this summer. Our mission sites are really amazing places. They offer people resources, the basic needs of life. 
They offer people hygiene products and food, and they give people training so that they can have basic life skills. And the work that they do is invaluable. And when we give our offering to God, that's where our money goes. And we have, we have chaplains who are serving at our major colleges and universities all over our state. And so when our children and our youth go off to Marshall and WVU and West Virginia State and Concord and Fairmont, there are chaplains there through the United Methodist Church who are helping nurture them in their faith. As that's kind of a, an impressionable time in their life as, as students are wondering about faith and life and we have this presence there to minister to them and to be there with them through some really challenging experiences. I can tell you personally that the giving that we do um, in, in the state, I, I've, I've watched it happen personally. In 2016, after the flood, that one of the churches that I served was significantly damaged. We had about a, a foot of water in our fellowship hall, which did enough damage that we essentially had to tear out all of our flooring, the walls, replace our cabinets in our kitchen. I mean, it was thousands and thousands of dollars of damage. And the monies that we gave through special offerings around our conference, our mission and disaster response groups, helped us rebuild all of our facility. They also gave us a grant paying 80% so that we could install showers in the top floor of our church. And in the three years that I was there subsequent to the flood, we hosted around 200 work teams that served in eastern and western Greenbrier County and in Nicholas County. And they worked in countless homes helping rebuild, helping rebuild a community. And living through that experience, I can tell you that if it wasn't for the church, for the body of Christ, people in the midst of disasters would be in trouble. Churches were coming together, Roman Catholic and Episcopalians and Mennonites and Southern Baptists and United Methodists. We were all coming together. I was a part of the, the Greater Greenbrier Long-Term Recovery Committee and a part of our ministerial association. And as I would go to, to meetings every Tuesday to hear about unmet needs, the United Methodist Church was always there to say, we can put money on the table to help this family get back into their home. And that's because when we offer our money to God, we're making a difference all around the state, all around our conference. And that doesn't really even begin to touch what happens globally. The United Methodist Church has partnered with the NBA, and through special giving opportunities, we have made a major dent in the problem of malaria in the world significantly reduced the problem of malaria in underdeveloped countries. Through our apportionments, we're able to send young adults in Africa to college, an opportunity that they would never have. But it's when we give our offering to God that it begins to spread and bless people all over the world. Our apportionment dollars go to help with health care for basic needs that people have, to help women in countries where they are experiencing threats and violence. God is using the United Methodist Church in powerful ways. And I think that if we kind of reel it back in and focus on the fact that if we are willing to live simple lives and be generous, then we can leave behind a whole lot more than the stuff that's going to go in our estate cell. And by doing that, we're not going to just be content. Our lives will be filled with hope and joy. Now, in 2019, we paid around 52% of our apportionments, which is a little bit more than we paid in 2018. So thank you for your faithfulness and giving. But I believe that if we come together, if we recognize the good that we're not just doing here and in our community, but around the world, if we can come together, I believe that we can do more together than we can do apart. I'm praying for a revolution here at St. Andrew, that we might be able to bless this community and bless people around the world. As Bill was talking in his 
children's message. As we heard in, in the scripture lesson today, we often misquote this passage and we often say, money is the root of all evil. Have you ever heard it recited like that? Well, that's not what Paul says. He says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money isn't bad, and money isn't good. It's neutral. It's what we do with it. And you and I have an opportunity to live simple lives and to be content in who God is and the grace that God has given us so that we can be generous and bless the lives of other people. We can use the resources that we have to bless so many people. I realize that sometimes people don't really like it when their pastor talks about money. But that's pretty challenging because that's one of the topics that Jesus talked about more than anything else. Not because Jesus preached a, a prosperity gospel where he was going around collecting money and living some kind of a lavish lifestyle. But Jesus talked about money more than anything else because he knew that it was a reflection of our values more than anything else. That's why he said, where your heart, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'm so blessed to be a part of this faith community. And I'm excited about what God is doing. I think that God can use us to do great things. And so as we listen for God's spirit and as we think about how that this might uh, apply to us, because each and every one of us are kind of in different circumstances, I want to invite you into a time of response. There might be some of us who are here today who are just so burdened with financial debt and you're not sure what to do about that. I want to let you know that you're not alone. I've already started having preliminary conversations about offering a, a class on debt management next fall on our, during our wonderful Wednesdays to provide an opportunity, a, kind of a support group to learn how to reduce debt so that we can live lives of simplicity and generosity. There might be some of us who are here today who we're trying to fill that void in our lives with something other than God. Maybe it's, it's time for us to really think about that. And what does that mean? Maybe it's time for us to begin to simplify our lives, to reduce what we've acquired, to think about the ways that we might be able to, to live more simply so that we can bless others and practice radical generosity. And there might be some of us here who are here today who are just kind of moved. The Spirit is speaking to you and you hear about our opportunities to be able to pay more in our apportionments this year. Maybe God is speaking to you to, to let that be something that you leave behind. Let that be something that you bless not only our congregation, but people around the world. I want to invite you in this moment to just consider what is it going to look like for me to take the steps to be content? And the answer is, it, it's not going to be getting more stuff or arriving at the place that we necessarily are striving for in life, but it's learning to look at the grace that God has given us and accept that and to live in the abundance of who God is. So in these moments, I hope that you'll pray and listen for God's Spirit to speak.